There's a lot of media out there in the world. TV shows, video games, music, comics. It is genuinely incomprehensible how much content has been produced. The media you grow up with is extremely important to influencing who you are today. The art we see influences us in ways we don't even realize. Every now and then, we'll want to look back on those memories and experience media from our past. However, that isn't always a possibility. Lost media is a term used to describe any piece of entertainment that is no longer available. Well, at least no longer easy to get your hands on, thus technically being lost. It doesn't matter if it's an episode of a cartoon, a piece of music, a video game, or even more obscure forms like an advertisement or website, one of your favorite pieces of media of all time might be undocumented. Over the years, a true community of dedicated searchers have banded together to find this forgotten media, in hopes of uncovering as much content as possible. There are always new and exciting topics being discussed and hunted for, and while there isn't always a huge search going on, chances are something's got the community's interest at all times. The scope of lost media is vast. It could be a historically important dub that contextualizes the struggles of bringing one of the most important shows of all time out of Japan and into America. Or it could be a variant Spongebob episode airing with a funny puppet gag thrown in. As long as something exists and people have proof of such, but that thing isn't available online, it counts as lost media. So today, let's take a look at some of the most interesting examples of it. This is a look at fascinating cases of lost media. Let's begin! Let's start with a case most of you have probably heard of before, A Day with Spongebob. Low-budget DVD releases are such a treat, aren't they? Ratatoying, extremely bare-bones collections, those weird documentaries, the bargain bin is a place full of non-stop gems. Most of these low-budget releases get forgotten over time, but in 2015, one unlicensed mockumentary changed the lost media scene forever. Let's take a look back at A Day with Spongebob Squarepants, the unauthorized mockumentary. A leader in the low-budget DVD market was a company named Regal Films. You ever wonder what company makes those cheap DVD features you've seen in bargain bins? Well, this company is one of them. They released many unauthorized and unofficial documentaries, generally focusing on celebrities. Of course, they couldn't use any footage of the actual celebrities, but their names and just discussing them is technically fair game. They're completely worthless, of course. Watch the Taylor Swift documentary with no footage of Taylor Swift, okay. But technically, they're not in the wrong. Things get a little more iffy when you're using an intellectual property like Spongebob, but that didn't stop the powers that be. And in 2011, someone somewhere put into motion a day with Spongebob Squarepants, leading to an Amazon listing. With this listing, people had a name, a release date, the cover, a barcode, and a now infamous plot synopsis. In this mockumentary, Spongebob lives above ground like all Hollywood superstars. Afraid that Spongebob is becoming old news, his boss runs a contest called Spend a Day with Spongebob. The contest makes Spongebob the talk of the town, as thousands of kids enter to win. The lucky winner is Seth, and he is ecstatic about his day with Spongebob. However, the day becomes a roller coaster ride as things do not go quite the way they planned. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, when the internet at large discovered this listing, it was out of stock, and no one had uploaded the movie online. And thus the hunt for a copy began. The Lost Media Wiki is a treasure trove of a website, with countless articles covering tons of lost media. In 2014, a page for a day with Spongebob was added to the site, which really got the ball rolling. But did it actually exist? Well, pre-orders were up on Amazon at one point, but no in-hand copies had ever appeared. All the reviews on the listing are fake, and have been since the search started. Note the lack of any sort of purchase confirmation. Over the years, countless Spongebob DVDs have been released, but no fan of the series had heard of this one. Soon enough, everyone was on board trying to find it. Amazon wasn't the only website that had listings for the movie, so that means it really did come out, right? Well, not really. See, that was the case because many websites simply mirror what was listed on Amazon, but these duplicate listings made it seem more like a product that had been circulating. But it quickly became clear that beyond the listing info and the cover, there was nothing. Okay, well... Let's take a closer look at the cover, starting with Seth. This now mythical jumping kid graphic is a stock photo, so this isn't the actor who would have played Seth in the movie. The background was found to be drawn by artist Jorge Pacheco, who when contacted said it was a commission for a client. Two versions were drawn, one which you see on the cover, and another never publicly seen, which looked much closer to Spongebob's actual pineapple house. Apparently, the client's lawyer asked for the second version we see on the cover. According to the artist, the client was a realtor, though it's unclear if the client was the creator of A Day with Spongebob. Maybe this drawing was commissioned for an advertisement for the realtor? It is a house after all. And then it was stolen for the cover? I guess we'll never know. 
That would imply whoever mocked up this cover used the art without permission. Though considering how the cover is full of lies anyway, it's possible. Yeah, the reviews at the top are totally forged. It's very likely this whole cover was made as part of a pitch for the movie. This cover is similar to what a final version could look like, but I doubt it was intended to be used. The legally distinct logo is basically the only original asset made for this, and it actually looks quite nice. Above it reads, Innovision Films Presents. Now, believe it or not, Innovision Films is another part of this cover that's pretty much made up. They're not a real company, it's just another name for Regal Films, who have gone under many names across their releases. It was learned that Regal Films was a distribution company. They buy other people's movies to sell on DVDs to make money, and their releases were made in small quantities, possibly even made to order. So yeah, it was gonna be hard to find this thing, let alone know who actually made it. One exciting lead appeared in August of 2015, when two Hastings employees found that the movie was in their store order catalog. They then proceeded to both order it, and neither got a copy. I remember summer 2015 so clearly, all these leads showing up and then dying immediately. Check out this tweet from January 1st, 2012, from a guy claiming to be watching the movie. Turns out he just accidentally called it that, and he was really just watching the original Spongebob movie. How does that happen? Come on! One of the biggest draws to A Day With Spongebob was, it just seemed so real. This is a liminal space cover. It totally looks like something you remember seeing. It felt so possible that someone could just find this in a store. For some reason, it felt so real. With a plot synopsis like that and the film's connection to Spongebob, it immediately became the poster boy of lost media hunting in 2015. Searchers all across the internet, especially on 4chan and the Lost Media Wiki, were looking for any trails they could find. The original hope was, okay, just find a copy of the DVD, but it quickly became much more than that. Also, with its popularity, hoaxes started showing up. Screenshots and videos claiming to be from the movie started showing up left and right. All turned out to be fake, of course. Every day, someone would post, look guys, look, I found a day with Spongebob. Check, 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 check. Whoa. This might be the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. An entire room full of Toys R Us managers. No, guys, seriously. I found it. One pretty great moment in the search history was the discovery of this YouTube upload from February 2014, which claimed to be the theme song of A Day with Spongebob. However, this was completely unrelated. It was just a fan project that happened to use the same name. But hey, we have a song people can sort of associate with the movie now, so that's something. Over time, the search got more and more bizarre. Members of the search team discovered how shady Regal films seemed to be, what with their many name changes, previous failed weird projects, and at the time, Regal's website would download a Trojan virus onto your computer if you tried to visit it. So overall, not a great looking company. Regal's headquarters were found to be in a mall, in a mall's food court to be exact, employees for Regal would deny working for the company, and that's if they could be contacted, as many seem to not exist, or be in jail. People started speculating Regal's DVDs were a front for a money laundering scheme, which honestly didn't seem that unbelievable. As time went on, the search became muddied with tons of people lying about their knowledge of the film, like one guy who said he worked for Regal, and that the movie was actually made by Viacom. He couldn't say how Regal acquired it, implying they might have sourced it illegally, but also he couldn't prove anything. He did say though that a few copies were out there, so with this story, the search continued. Despite these red herrings, the search never really ended. There's another company involved here, named MVD Entertainment Group. They distributed many of Regal's DVDs. The Amazon listing also shows another company. You can see why it would be so hard to track down info on the people involved, which was definitely intentional. MVD's customer support actually gave some info about its release, saying its production was never finished, but also said that promotional copies may have been made and might be out there. Eventually, eyes began to focus on a man named Lorenzo Holly, a man who's founded two food-based companies, both of which share the same address as Regal's. Yeah, that's probably a coincidence. When contacted, many employees of these food companies had no knowledge of Regal, but did know Lorenzo. With this knowledge, people then found a Regal associate on a site called Stage 32, and looking at the comments on that page, people put it together that this associate was Lorenzo. Not much was found, other than an address. Someone had asked where to send their movie for potential Regal distribution. That address was found to be shared by an adult-only massage parlor. After all that craziness, search members actually got in touch with Lorenzo over Skype, where he explained many details about the movie and its release. He said the movie was released, but then recalled, though an improved version was planned. 
He said it could be done through the use of crowdfunding. Yeah, this didn't happen. Well, the movie was released, but it was recalled. Maybe a copy could still be found and we could sleep again? Is anyone telling the truth here? On August 3rd of that same year, Lorenzo disclosed more info about the film, and also got the search team hooked up with, uh, the creator of A Day with Spongebob, who went by the alias Mr. Orange. Orange called with the search team, and again we got some nice info. The film was, apparently, meant to be good, have wholesome messages, and be a nice film for all ages. The creator knew there was no way they were going to get the Spongebob license, so they went the mockumentary route. But here's the thing, he says the movie was never finished, and nothing was really shot for it. That's right, this apparently never even existed. This film that generated so much speculation, demand, contacting, and searching, never even existed in the first place. Now, to be fair, this was all said by someone who claimed to be the creator, but not much proof was ever given. He did supply five pages of an unfinished script for the movie, but could we really trust this? Also, Seth is now called Andy in the script, just okay. Mr. Orange might not have been the real creator, instead just being someone Lorenzo got to shut us stupid lost media hunters up. We don't know if anything anyone has said regarding this movie can be trusted. Well, in the end, we'll probably never get answers. Today, Regal and other involved companies' sites are closed, and the search is over. Sorry, there was nothing. It was a wild ride, though, seeing everything everyone discovered about Regal Films, opening our eyes to such a fascinating, sketchy, and bizarre industry. I think it's alright this movie never happened. It would have never beaten SpongeBob Squares Up Fights Two Women. Considering it was never made, I guess this movie is one step beyond Lost Media, and is a part of the media that was never even finished category, but that's opening up an entirely separate can of worms. Even if the movie did exist, who cares, right? This wouldn't have been amazing or anything, what's even the point? Shouldn't things like this stay lost? No! Curiosity will always win out. Something like this eats away at you until you know the truth. We would have gone mad if we never cracked the case. Technically we didn't, and it's still being discussed today. Funny thing is, there are unofficial Spongebob releases similar to this that do actually exist, such as Spongebob in Tehran, and other similar films. These are total bootleg releases, with no involvement from Nickelodeon. Maybe if this mockumentary was made in the country where Viacom wouldn't have launched Regal to the moon over it, it could have happened. One thing we can thank A Day with Spongebob for is really getting Lost Media hunting off the ground. When this was big, everyone was talking about it, and it made the concept of Lost Media as a whole truly recognized. If not for this movie, even if it never existed, who knows if future searches would have caught on in the way they did. With that said, even though this all turned out to be a bunch of nothing, those memories of looking for it and following the search are something we'll never forget. The most popular medium to search for in the lost media scene is probably cartoons and animation. It's a perfect fit. Lots of people have tons of memories of watching cartoons when they were younger, but not all of them were properly archived, especially as you go back through time. Do you realize how many cartoons are out there, from all over the world? Do you know how many shows exist that get no coverage? The 2006 Korean cartoon Z Squad has existed this whole time, but has anyone ever talked about it? No. So naturally, considering the quantity of media produced, a lot of shows go missing, at least for a long time. Now, Z Squad has all of its episodes on various streaming services, but not every show is as lucky. Shows like Disney's Timo Supremo have never had solid re-releases, and thus to this day some episodes are impossible to find. The Nickelodeon show Kablam is pretty well remembered, but for a while no one knew how many episodes of it existed. It wasn't until the show's creator uploaded all of them to his website in 2015 where we got confirmation. Even standard episodes of shows can become subjects, as some episodes are modified from their original airings on later releases. SpongeBob is infamous for how many deleted scenes the show has. In just one bite, the scene where Squidward breaks into the Krusty Krab was cut down, reportedly due to the use of igniting gas. If a deleted scene was only in the original airing of an episode, it can be quite hard to find a high-quality rip of it, or any rip at all. Even the Season 12 episode Spongebob in Random Land was changed. The original cut of the episode included a reference to the Squidward suicide creepypasta. Though it being a reference to a creepypasta, I think that really helps the scene. Years from now people will think they're crazy because they remember Red Mist Squidward being in it. These Spongebob examples are unusual as most deleted scenes are never aired. Some were animated but then not used in the final version of the episode, like with the Super Mario World episode Mama Luigi, whose deleted scenes we only know of thanks to animation cells. There's also this legendary set of Spongebob cells. Luckily, cells typically indicate where they were to be used, so we know this is a scrapped scene from the episode Texas. 
Some scenes were in storyboards, but then were never animated for whatever reason. This all makes finding and documenting stuff like cells and storyboards incredibly important, as you never know what could be found. Nowadays, a lot of shows are released digitally, so stuff like this is less common. A show like Talking Tom and Friends never has to worry about becoming lost, but for older shows that never got full releases, yeah, it was a little bit trickier when there was no YouTube to MP4. Though, even older shows are now being released officially on streaming services and even YouTube. Ad revenue can be so good, it's worth it for some companies. So as time goes on, we most likely will see more and more shows get preserved like this. A great source of cartoon lost media is pilots. TV show pilots are made as a sort of test run, to show what a general episode of the final show would be like, more or less. Sometimes, these pilots are shown off as a sneak preview of the series, or maybe even released later as a bonus feature on a home media release. Rocket Power's pilot is a curious example. The pilot, known as Rocket Beach, is actually publicly viewable, but only at the Paley Center for Media. They have the largest archive of television, radio, and internet media in America, and that somehow includes the Rocket Power pilot. It can only be watched there, but maybe someday it will be released. At least we know it still exists. A few shots of it are in the final show's intro, explaining why Otto has these scary white eyes in some shots. Screenshots have also been found, and an extremely low-quality clip of it sourced from Nick.com in the 90s has been uploaded to YouTube. This is Ocean Park, California. Home to me and the coolest buds around. Too bad school gets in the way. This life would be perfect if all we can do is hang out. Mega Man Fully Charged is a show that went through a lot of changes during its development. It was originally announced in 2015, with this less than stellar 2D artwork of Mega Man. When the show came out, it was animated with CGI, but this art actually does represent what the show was originally going to look like. It seems a 2D animated pilot of some sort was made for the show, as clips from it were found in an animation demo reel from an animator who worked on it. The full pilot has never been seen. An early version of the opening, CGI this time, has also surfaced online, with the show titled simply as Mega Man at this stage. Kappa Mikey is a show that I somehow had never heard of until way after its original airing, but it's one that infinitely fascinates me. I watched a ton of Nicktoons when I was younger, and yet I have no memory of ever seeing it. Only years later did I become conscious of its existence. Turns out there were two lost pilots for it. Well, technically three. The funny fellows over at the Kappa Mikey production team named the first episode the lost pilot, completely unaware that the show's actual pilots would become lost years later. One pilot was made around 2004 for MTV. This one was lost until 2017, when the show's director uploaded it to YouTube, after tons of dedicated searchers showed that there was interest in it getting released. Before its release, this is a pilot that was thought to be completely gone, and even if it did still exist, maybe copyright stuff would prevent its release. But on July 26, 2017, Kappa Mikey history was made. The MTV pilot was saved, and it was well worth the wait. Again, since I've seen so little of it, I'm more a fan of this show just because it exists and less the show itself. So to see more lore from the series was right up my alley, and at the time, I couldn't believe it was found. Seriously, thank you to everyone who worked to get this one preserved. This one will always be a highlight in my lost media memories. It's still up on YouTube and absolutely everyone interested in this stuff should check it out. Being made for MTV, it's a bit more adult than the final series, with some questionable jokes but what a treat this was. I love this one, in all of its temp audio, 2004, unfinalized Kappa Mikey glory. This is also a really great example of a pilot, with everything being just a little different than the final series. Eventually, it was decided the show wouldn't air on MTV, but instead Nicktoons. This isn't that strange as both are owned by Viacom, so really it was just decided to make the show more for kids. That brings us to the other pilot, or really animation test, which was made for Nicktoons, but surprisingly looks even more different than the MTV one. <laughs> The characters are the same, but the show has a totally different art style, with a lot more blatant references to designs from various anime. The voice cast is also completely different. This one is only three minutes long, and was discovered on a Nicktoons Film Festival promotional DVD, which was found at a thrift store. It seems to be from the 2005 festival. Thanks to this honestly miraculous finding, all of the contents on the DVD are now on the Internet Archive, and the finder also put the Kappa Mikey short onto YouTube. This one is more like a trailer for the show, and actually is where a lot of these old screenshots we thought were from the MTV pilot come from. The animation is extremely rough, but this one is super funny. It is unbelievable something of this quality was picked up and made into a show. A great watch.
this even happens, thank goodness that didn't make it into the final series. Pilots in general are always such great sources of lost media cases, as almost all of them show very intriguing differences to their final counterparts, while also generally not being released. It's always so exciting when they get recovered too. It's new content of old shows you've never seen before. I mean, where would we be without the high high puffy Yumi pilot? Again, nowadays, a lot of pilots are released publicly, but that absolutely was not the case even just a few decades ago. Lost episodes of shows? Eh. Pilots of shows? Eh. Ooh, bumpers of shows. Now we're talking! Show me Dragon Ball GT next on Nicktoons! TV commercials and bumpers are a whole other can of beans. For the majority of old commercials, you need TV recordings that happen to have them in between episodes. There are a fair share of commercials that people remember that aren't archived. The only hope to find those is either the original creator re-releasing them, which normally isn't viable as most old commercials are advertising products no longer being supported, or someone could have a recording of it and will upload it someday. Both are extremely unlikely, but could always happen. Some projects are made solely to be played in between other shows, such as Adventures in Nutrition with Captain Carlos, a series of flash animated shorts that aired on Disney Junior, at the time known as Playhouse Disney, from 2004 to 2007. Shorts like these that air in between shows typically don't see complete home releases, and unfortunately Captain Carlos has yet to see any complete series release, and I don't think that's going to happen. So if not for these recordings and a few official uploads, all of this show could have been lost. And Carlos is far from the only example of this. Astrology with Squidward was a once obscure set of Spongebob shorts, featuring Squidward giving horoscopes for various zodiac signs. These shorts aired on Nicktoons until 2005, but after that, they never aired again on TV, and as is so common for this type of production, were never given a home release. But when they were on TV, they aired often and tons of people remembered them. Over time, a handful of the shorts appeared online in varying quality and even language. Despite their obscurity, these were actually dubbed for a few international Nick channels. There are 12 zodiac signs, so naturally people assume there were 12 shorts. With only a few uploaded, it was impossible to prove whether or not more were out there. Eventually, crew members who worked on the show confirmed that only six exist. There were so many rumors and claims from people saying they've seen the missing signs before, but it seems there's no truth to any of that. This one is a good example of bad documentation and people misremembering, leading to speculation of media that might be out there but actually doesn't exist. On February 2nd, 2020, the Spongebob YouTube channel uploaded a compilation of the shorts, no doubt in response to the demand generated by the lost media community. So, only six shorts exist, but it seems the assets were reused at least once. So, tie a tie and tune your horn and hide that ugly rash! Places, please! It's time for Spongebob Nicktoons Summer Slash! It's Rocket Power Day, so let's blast off! TV networks having seasonal blocks is nothing special, but some go the extra mile and create new content for them. From July to August in 2000 and 2001, Nickelodeon had a variety marathon block called SpongeBob's Nicktoon Summer Splash, where SpongeBob and the gang hosted, with clips of them airing between each episode. A lot of stuff was made for this block which only lasted so long. We don't have everything from it, including what seems to be an astrology with Squidward clip. We do have a lot of content from it though. Not everything is in the best quality, but a lot of people seem to have recorded this marathon on VHS tapes. So thankfully, we'll never be able to forget the events of Rocket Power Day. Before the Spongebob version, Henry and June from Kablam! hosted their own Nicktoon Summer Marathon, which featured its own great original content. June? Yes, Henry? I'm going to say something, and I'm going to say it very loud. Are you ready? Sure. I'm going to say that next week is the premiere of Spongebob Squarepants! Wow. These blocks often have tons of original material made for them, but all of that is made solely for the moment, never to be seen again after they've aired, making them excellent sources of lost media. Recordings of original or special airings can be extremely important to have, or at least they're very nostalgic. Thank goodness the method of VHS recording existed. It unfortunately would be impossible to have every second of every network recorded and saved, so there will always be stuff that falls through the cracks. For many of these limited airing cases, we're just lucky someone out there taped it, and not only that, still had their tape. Hunting for lost media is fun because no matter how impossible something may seem, there's always a slight chance it could be found. Going back to animation cells, they weren't just used for animation. Promotional art was also drawn on cells once upon a time, and some cells of never-before-seen art from never-before-seen projects have been seen. 
Check out these Mega Man cells that were auctioned off in 2021. A group of fans banded together to win them, and now it's been confirmed these were from a 1992 anime project that was cancelled. But these great pieces will forever live on. How about cells of productions that have never been released in great quality? Like ones from old game openings. The intros for games like Dragon Ball Final Bout and Ultimate Battle 22 are so fantastic, but we've never seen them in show level resolution. The animation cells give us a glimpse at what that looks like. Some cells themselves are lost, as in the physical item. Some have never been sold off. Cells from smaller productions like game openings are much harder to find, and we're still waiting for the day a box of Sonic OVA cells show up. The best we have of those are these phone cards from Japan, as well as these images from the Japanese VHS cases of the two episodes. You can see these are actually scans of cells. Note Knuckles' incomplete body here. There is a lot to look into with cartoon lost media. There's so much more than even what was talked about here. For example, don't even get me started on international broadcasts or dubs of shows. Foreign dubs and similar subjects are some of my favorite things to research with media, but that's a completely separate topic, with so much to discuss just there. There really is an endless amount of lost media content. Out of all forms of media, movies might consistently go through the most amount of changes during development. It does make sense, considering how big of a deal they can be. They're always large-scale projects with tons of people working on them, and have developments that last years, if not decades. In that time and with all those ideas forming, things are bound to get lost in the mix. Ever heard of the cancelled Disney movie American Dog? This was a movie that was to star a dog named Henry, a famous TV star. After an accident on set, he finds himself lost in the desert alongside a cat and a rabbit. Does this sound familiar? That's because this movie, American Dog, eventually became the 2008 movie, Bolt. Pokemon the first movie was once planned to be the finale of the anime series, similar to how Gold and Silver were planned to be the final games. Of course, it was decided to keep Pokemon going and it continues on to this day, but before that was decided, an early teaser for the film was released. Nothing from the final movie is used in this trailer, which actually isn't strange for Pokemon movie teasers. But since this was done so early, it depicts a very different movie than the one we got. Famously, it shows Misty as an adult, along with two unnamed characters. As this was meant to be the finale of the show, it looks like it would have featured a time skip showing where all the characters ended up. We don't see Ash or Brock in these scenes, but Pikachu is there, and fans speculate that this child could have been Ash and Misty's kid. Of course, plans completely changed and none of this happened, but it's interesting to see what could have been. The original version of the movie Food Fight was stolen and was never recovered, so that's lost. There are countless animation tests that are produced for movies and then never released, which then become lost over time. In 2012, animation tests for live-action Marvin the Martian and Hong Kong Fooey movies were posted by the director online. It's likely both of these movies were dead at that point, as these probably wouldn't have been able to be released otherwise. The movies never happened, but we'll always have this lovely footage to wonder what could have been. In 2009, the Hong Kong-based animation studio Amaji released an Astro Boy movie in theaters, to almost no fanfare. Fans were very excited for its release, but it didn't live up to expectations. It failed to catch on with general audiences, didn't bring in many new fans for the series, was a box office bomb, and it was the last movie released by the studio. Huh. Astro Boy is a very weird franchise to me. For how monumentally important it is, I've never been too invested in it. It seems at least nowadays, tons of people are aware of Astro Boy, but it's not nearly as popular as it could be. The movie should have been a smash hit, and while I think it's alright, it just didn't land. One point of contention is the film's art style. The movie lost a lot of the flair that made the original illustration so iconic. Toby looks like your standard CGI American movie kid, for example. However, it seems this wasn't always going to be the case. Early promotional images for the film show an art style much closer to the original look of Astro Boy. You can really see it in the face. But where does this come from? This scene isn't anywhere in the movie, and if it was, it wouldn't look anything like this. Over the years, loads of production art and work for the movie have been released, found on various artist portfolios. One animation demo reel by Amaji animator Wayne Fung shows tons of raw footage from Astro Boy, and at the end, we see this. A shot dated May 22, 2007, showing a very expressive early Astro Boy. As it turns out, this scene, that image, and more screenshots that have shown up over the years are all from an animation test made for the movie in 2007. Unfortunately though, as you can probably guess, this test has never been released. This one scene is the only bit of animation we've seen from it. 
If it wasn't for this demo reel and those screenshots used for promotion, we may have never known this awesome piece of Astro Boy animation existed. It makes you think about how much early test material must be made and then never shown off. How much lost media is out there that we don't even know about? Speaking of Astro Boy, it feels like it's been a very long time since the series has gone on a true refresh. There are newer shows aimed at young demographics, but nothing like the older shows. I assume if the movie was a bigger hit, a new series would have been made. But since it didn't exactly blow up, nothing has materialized. But man, are they trying. Let me give you all a crash course on a show called Astro Boy Reboot. So I didn't see the movie in theaters, but I did watch it shortly after it was released. And years later, I remember thinking, man, why isn't there a modern Astro Boy show? So I looked it up online and I found this. Astro Boy Reboot Teaser. A teaser trailer for a new Astro Boy series. And it looked awesome. Something about this trailer just captivated me. Maybe it was the music? The visuals look really cool too. I can't wait for this to come out, I said in 2015. We're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. At the 2014 Annecy Festival, Tessica Productions announced the show, being a global production, made with France's Carabara Productions and Monaco's Shibuya Productions. The show was announced to be a 26 half-hour episode long, 2D and CGI hybrid cartoon. What was really intriguing about it though, was that while it was being overseen by Tezuka Productions, it was said that the show would be a brand new take on Astro Boy, completely different from the shows that had come before it. This show was to be set in the present day, would feature new original characters, hope to bring the franchise to new modern audiences, and include, quote, positive things from the past version and new elements. This truly was an Astro Boy reboot, which by the way, is such a genius title. At the event, it was said a teaser would be released in September of 2014. That month came and went, however, with no teaser. On March 21st, 2015, though, the teaser was officially revealed and was uploaded onto Carrie Barra's YouTube channel, showcasing the show in motion for the first time. And to this day, it's basically the only piece of animation that has officially been shown off for the show. We do have this, though, the rough animation for the teaser, uploaded onto Vimeo by the animator. Not super important, but it's one of the few pieces of content we have from the show, so it's worth mentioning. Curiously, the description says the rough was finished in November of 2014, so that September date was way off. News on the show then went cold for a long time. Was it cancelled? Nope, because this poster was revealed at the Monaco Anime Games International Conferences, or MAGIC, in 2016, showing off a whole lot of characters and, along with it, we got a basic plot synopsis. Look! New characters! Fabuki and Akino, who are definitely not from any other incarnation of Astro Boy. So with new art and a synopsis, maybe production is going smooth? Around the same time, this teaser image was revealed. Despite looking a lot like Astro, this is Atlas, another classic Astro Boy character, who was now confirmed to be in the series. This update also listed the show as having 52 11-minute episodes, so the structure had changed. So then there were no updates for a year, but in March of 2017, again at Magic, we got concept art. Lots of art showing Astro and his new friends. Still looks pretty good. It would be nice if the show actually came out though. Towards the end of 2017, this new piece was revealed alongside some new details. Nothing much, but okay. In 2018, a tweet from Shibuya claimed their main broadcasting partner was gearing up to make an announcement about the show soon, but also said to not expect to see the show in 2018. Now this tweet was from January 2018, and they were already saying don't expect it within the entire next year. Well, I guess they were right. At Magic 2019, we got more concept art. Well, a lot of it was the same as what we'd seen before, but Astro is now wearing red. Okay, is the show gonna come out now? There was some nice character model sheets and some landscape stuff shown. Our boy Fabuki now has tons of artwork, so that's great. And this photo shows on screen a frame from the teaser, but with the new red design. Is there an updated version of the teaser with this red design? Considering they went back and changed other artwork, it's possible. On July 10th, 2019, the president of Shibuya replied to a tweet, claiming that a big US network had been preventing the release of news. On January 1st, 2020, they once again replied saying yes, they're still working on it. Once again saying the networks are why it's been slow. On April 18th of that year, they said, working on it. Man, it'll be out, they say. Don't expect anything in 2018, they say. Teaser coming September 2014, they say. But guess what? In March of 2021, in an interview, it was confirmed the show is still being worked on, and news might be coming soon. And that's been said many times, but hey, hopefully this entire segment will one day not belong in this video if this show ever actually comes out. 
I think it's pretty clear some true development hell is going on with this show, but hey, considering it's stuck around for so long, I think we'll see it someday. It's totally possible this show is finished, it's just being held up for one reason or another. We're in this weird era where tons of media is being produced, but then held off for years from release, as the landscape of the industry completely changes thanks to streaming services and stuff like that. This could be a case very similar to Star Wars Detours, which was a fully produced comedy series from around 2012. A trailer for it is available online and all episodes are finished, but the show was never released following Disney's purchase of the IP. Astro Boy is a huge franchise. A new cartoon, especially one that could make this show more popular outside of Japan, is a big deal. So making sure it's the best fit for the IP must be top priority. Maybe over time, new, better ideas for relaunching Astro Boy were thought up. There is actually a new show called Go Astro Boy Go, aimed at a younger demographic than a reboot would be, and that's been doing just fine. This show was also a French-Japan collab. The show was technically announced in 2014, as more episodes of the 2014 show Little Astro Boy. Then in 2016, it was confirmed to be its own series, though still using that name. Then in 2019, it was rebranded and released as a new show. Astro Boy shows changing during development seems to be an ongoing trend. Even an English dub of that show exists now, but its fellow announced series is still missing. There's also a new anime, and a live-action movie that's been in development for a long time. All of these are different and clashing forms of the IP, and maybe after the movie flopped, Tezuka Productions could be very protective over what gets released. But seriously, those episodes might have been produced and are just sitting somewhere. We know at least some work was done on it. Animators who worked on the show have posted stuff they did for it. There must be so much we don't know going on behind the scenes. I just hope everyone's work on this can eventually get seen. This could really flourish on a streaming platform. If it's of any quality, I think it could be a hit. Hey, I'm sure Tubi would take it. Years after that original trailer, every now and then we see some small glimmer of the show still being worked on. I mean, I just want to see it, just to see what it's like. It's been so long. Even if it's not the best, it would be great to see it come out. What if Fubuki is like the greatest character of all time and we have no idea? It's still on Shibuya's website, the teaser is still public. Considering how much work has already been put into it, maybe someday we'll see Astro Boy Reboot take flight. Long before Lost Media as a whole became popular, Lost video game content was already constantly being researched, thanks to sites like The Cutting Room Floor and Unseen 64. Betas, prototypes, uncommon early releases of games, video game preservation is known for getting little support from developers, leading to it resting on the shoulders of historians who have, for decades, been doing a great job archiving this industry's history. Early game builds count as Lost Media, but how about games that were basically done but then went unreleased? Jerry Boy 2 was a planned 1994 sequel to the 1991 game Smart Ball, known in Japan as Jerry Boy. This game was actually developed by Game Freak and is quite fun. The sequel was set to expand on the original game in many ways, and really open up the lore of Jerry Boy. The original was published by Sony Music Entertainment Japan, and the sequel was set to be the same way. But with the PlayStation on the way, Nintendo and Sony weren't very buddy-buddy in 1994. Sony publishing a Super Nintendo game was out of the question, leading to the game being cancelled suddenly, very close to being finished, due to it no longer having a publisher. Long after its cancellation, a ROM of the game was made available online. As the game was cancelled very late in development, it's totally playable. There's even a fan-made English translation of the game as well. ROMs of cancelled video games are always a huge win for the lost media scene. Socks the Cat Rocks the Hill is another classic example. It's a game about Bill Clinton's cat. It was advertised, promoted, but then cancelled. How could they cancel a game like this? In any case, a sample cartridge of the game was known to be in circulation. The owner of that cartridge eventually uploaded this really low-quality, barely watchable video of the game in action, with the low-quality being intentional as a joke. Looking back, doing this was pretty funny, but I've never understood this thought process. If there's no ROM of the game out there, clear footage of it really wouldn't diminish its value at all. Even if there was a ROM dump of the game, the original cartridge would still be worth something. The physical item will always be worth its historical value alone. Long after that video, and this is pretty crazy, but after trading hands, the owner of the cartridge eventually bought the rights to the game, and went to crowdfunding to get the game a physical release. The company Second Dimension published it, and through $33,000 being raised on Kickstarter, the game was released, and now we can all play this amazing game about Socks the Cat rockin' the hill. How about games that had downloadable content that's no longer available due to servers going down? This is unfortunately very common. Full games have even gotten lost to time for at least a little while due to having download-only releases. 
Even if they had a physical release, many games rely at least partially on internet servers that will someday go down. And unless fans are there to revive it, those games could become partially if not completely unplayable. Thankfully, fan efforts to bring dead games back to life are fairly common. That is if the game is popular enough, and recent enough. But online-only content isn't a new thing. Even in the 90s, there were downloadable game services such as Sega Channel for the Genesis, or the Japanese-only Satellaview for the Super Nintendo. These were very ahead of their time, offering downloadable games and demos that cycled through different options often. While these must have been a sight to behold when they first came out, once the services were discontinued, it became incredibly hard to play what was offered. Garfield Caught in the Act is a game that was released for multiple platforms in the 90s. It stars Garfield, trapped in John Arbuckle's TV, searching for a way out. As such, each level in the game is based off of popular TV tropes. The game in the grand scheme of things is fairly basic, but is full of creativity and has artwork done by Jim Davis himself. The Sega Genesis release came out first in 1995 and featured six levels. A Game Gear version hit stores a month later and had eight levels. A PC version was released in 1996, and contained a different level order, including one not found in the other versions. So there wasn't much consistency between each release of the game, but it seems all of these levels were once planned for the Genesis version. See, while the Genesis version was a fully playable game, it technically was released unfinished. The game was originally planned to feature many more levels, as well as having extended versions of the existing ones. Despite missing the retail release, it's believed the cut Genesis levels were later finished, and released through Sega Channel. Garfield The Lost Levels, as it's known by fans, was an exclusive separate game available through the service, and featured Genesis Garfield content not seen anywhere else. This is like if Sega released Sonic 2 Special Edition for the Sega Channel, which included a finished version of Hidden Palace Zone, Wood Zone, Genocide City Zone, but now they're all lost because they were only released on this service. When you were using Sega Channel, as soon as you turned off your Genesis, the game you downloaded would be erased, and you'd have to re-download it. The Nintendo Satellaview allowed you to download a game onto your cartridge, so a number of those exclusives have been preserved, but that's not the case at all with Sega Channel. If you wanted to play its exclusives, you needed to be there when they were available to be streamed. Garfield The Lost Levels was never released in any other capacity. Aspects of the game are available in the other versions, but the Genesis version of these levels are completely gone. No footage even exists of this version of the game, and the details of it aren't even fully confirmed. It's believed that three levels cut from the retail release were available in the Lost Levels. A snowy level titled Bonehead the Barbarian, a Robin Hood-themed stage titled Slobin Hood, and it's rumored the final level is alien or space-themed. This promotional shirt shows Garfield in various outfits corresponding to levels in the game, including some that aren't featured in the final version. There is Slobin Hood himself in the bottom right corner, and the top left shows Garfield in space gear. And so, these levels truly are lost to time. Screenshots are the only reason we even know they existed, and the only reason we know they were released are recounts from the few people who played the lost levels. It's very unlikely these will ever see the light of day again. Perhaps the people involved with the game's creation still have access to them, assuming they kept their Garfield video game assets all this time. But even if they did, what, are they gonna do a re-release as a complete edition or something? I doubt that'd be seen as a worthwhile investment. Interesting to note, an enhanced version of the game was going to be released for the Sega 32X, titled Garfield in TV Land. This was probably going to be a fully realized version of the Genesis game, but it was cancelled. However, yeah, I guess the cut levels still are kinda playable. The Game Gear version features both Bonehead the Barbarian and Slobin Hood, and the space level is in the PC version, known as Alien Landscape. But all of this is just the unfortunate nature of downloadable content with games. When servers go down and the game is no longer supported, it's a miracle anything survives. Digital games that receive updates over time are also a victim of this. Old classic Roblox games like Kirby Obby PM Me If You Have a Problem no longer function properly. It's sad but true. Old Roblox games get slowly withered down by the sands of Roblox updates and we all feel the effects. Need I even bring up games like Club Penguin? There are fan servers for a lot of these, but the true official experience with these games may never happen again. It wouldn't be a Lost Media retrospective video without bringing up Mean Girls for the DS. Mean Girls is a classic 2004 movie, and around 2010, someone seeked to make a timely piece of shovelware, releasing a game based off of the film for the DS. Or did they? Listings for the game are up on many shopping sites, it was rated, but no one had a copy of it. Most DS shovelware games are so common, it made no sense for a game like this to be rare. So what's up with it? There were articles, a lot of discussions, and even countdown videos from the time of its release. A comment on that video told it like it is, 
Do games get so irrelevant, they become lost? The theory was this game was so amazingly unremarkable no one talked about it post-release, or even bought a copy. Screenshots of the game were found on the Italian video game site Multiplayer, in their review of the game. So the game existed in some capacity. What happened to it? Unfortunately, it's not a very interesting story. According to the game's publisher, 505 Games, it was just never fully published. So it never came out. But for years, these screenshots and listings taunted us. Ugh, let us play Mean Girls for the DS, come on! Though the game was never sent to stores, there might be a review copy out there somewhere. If sites have official reviews of it, something must have been sent to them. And guess what? That was correct. The game is real and does exist. In 2021, what could be salvaged of the game was unearthed, and it's now fully preserved. So after all these years, us Mean Girls DS enjoyers can finally rest easy. Some video games are lost because they never got past the pitching phase, like Legacy of Goku 4. Webfoot Technologies, developers of the Legacy of Goku series for the Game Boy Advance, wish to return to the IP with a fourth game, for the Nintendo 3DS and or iOS devices. From 2015 to 2016, they produced various mock-ups of what the game could be like. The team couldn't find a publisher to help fund the project. Stuff like that, media that was never finished or released, really counts less as lost media and more as vaporware. But to see stuff like those pitch images is still great. Once again, it makes you think about how much content is out there that we just don't know about. There must be millions of projects that are never mentioned publicly. The abyss of lost media truly is endless. One thing to consider while hunting for lost media is, well, if something is worth the trouble. In a perfect world, everything ever made by anyone would be saved and easy to find and this video wouldn't exist. Unfortunately, we don't live in that world so we have to choose what's worth saving and what isn't. The way I look at it is if something is important to even just a small group of people, it's worth archiving. The world could have gone on without the original airing of a Charlie Brown Christmas being found with the Coca-Cola thing at the end, but it's cool that's backed up and people who remember it will always be able to see it. There are things you can argue should remain lost. For example, the British-made Hail Honey I'm Home is a wacky 1990s sitcom starring Hitler and his wife as they get into hilarious antics with their Jewish neighbors. Eleven episodes were planned, eight were recorded, but only one aired. You can probably guess why. The debate of what's worth finding gets really muddy when you bring up internet media, like YouTube videos. It's very easy for a video to be deleted and have it be gone forever. Some people save videos to ensure they never get lost. But obviously not every video has that luxury. And if you're talking about videos pre-2010, a lot of notable ones have become lost. But does it really matter? These videos didn't play on TV. They didn't have huge ad campaigns that proved their existence. There are definitely a few videos I remember watching that have been lost to time. And it would be nice to see them again, but it's just so unlikely. Thankfully, a lot of lost YouTube videos that were big enough to have search efforts for them have been recovered over the years. But while we're talking about online content, I have a personal piece of internet lost media that's pretty much guaranteed to be gone forever. Okay, I might be degrading myself here a little bit, but back in the late 2000s, my parents forbid me from using YouTube, after I watched one or two inappropriate robot chicken videos or something. So, instead of YouTube, I used a website called kidstube.com. Hey kids, do you like to shoot your own videos? Then join KidsTube.com and share your videos with thousands of other kids just like you. KidsTube was a YouTube alternative, created by Sean Sansel, an award-winning animator who founded the company Pencilman Animations. They've done a lot of TV commercials, web animations, and more. You ever seen Man It Feels Good to Be a Pencil? Fantastic piece of work. Putting the site in the Wayback Machine, it seems the site launched in late 2008, with that commercial being uploaded to YouTube in February 2009. Nowadays, a site like this sounds like a joke, but it was successful when it was new. I made an account there and started making videos with Windows Movie Maker. Nothing worth archiving, just stuff like YouTube poops and various other wannabe copycat content. I made so many videos for this site. I'm sure none of them were anything substantial, but I was a big fan and it was a lot of fun. Most of my videos were very basic video edits or literally two second videos of just an image and that's it. I do remember making quite a few that involved Club Penguin, and uh, possibly making my own Club Penguin fan series. I'm gonna withhold the info I remember about that. Look, Kids Tube was the bottle, and I took a swig, my friend. Eventually, I got older and was graciously allowed back onto YouTube. Thus, my Kids Tube days were behind me. I never forgot about the site, but I didn't check it very often. It seemed to still be pretty active any time I checked, though, so it definitely had users in the 2010s. Then one time in 2015, I checked, and it was down. Completely gone. Here's a quote from the Kids Tube wiki. It, sadly, shut down around 2015. This wiki and kidstubewikia.com remains. 
We are still trying to find out why it vanished, and if there will ever be an awesome site like this again. Apparently, the site shut down with no explanation, no time for people to archive their videos. It's likely a good majority of the content made for this site is completely lost, thankfully including my work. I made all of those videos on an old computer. None of them were backed up, and I lost the source files when that computer died. And with the site down, all of them are gone. Years ago, I looked around for sketchy sites that might have mirrored them. I found one that had thumbnails of videos, but that was it. And I'm pretty sure that site's down now, too. There's also, of course, the Internet Archive that captured the site itself. Though none of the videos work, that is certainly better than nothing. There really seemed to be no explanation of why the site shut down. So as one does, I emailed the site's creator. If I'm remembering correctly, he basically said the website became too much work or too expensive to be worth keeping up, so it was taken down. Understandable, but this has left the community in complete shambles. Imagine the people who use the site every day logging on and seeing, okay, all my videos are gone, whoops. Now the site only remains as a memory in the mind of its users, much like any other website that has met a similar fate. In the internet age, preserving media can be harder than ever. Many people could be growing up on content that could easily not exist in the future. While not everything online is worth saving, hopefully there will be less cases like KidsTube in the future. It's happened to all of us. You're on a drive to Target flipping through the radio until you hear a song you've never heard before. You instantly become a huge fan, but for one reason or another, you never look the song up and forget about it. Years later, you remember the song, but can't quite remember the name of it. You eventually remember maybe a full sentence from it and look it up on Google. There it is. You should consider yourself lucky, because that definitely isn't what happened in this case. On March 18th, 2007, Blue, a user of the website Spirit of Radio, which is a fan site for a Canadian radio station, posted a snippet of the song, claiming they recorded it somewhere around 1982 to 1984, off of a German radio station, and have been looking for info about the song ever since. The initial post didn't gain much attention, but it eventually got the traction it deserved when a Reddit user named Gab Gaskins posted about the song in 2019. They linked their YouTube upload of that same clip, hoping to find more info about it. While nowadays when a song comes out it gets immediately archived, many small releases from around the time of this song have likely fallen into just as much obscurity as the song we're talking about today. No music identifier software can trace the song, and no one has come forth with any information at all. What was the song's name? The band? What were the lyrics? All people had to go off of was the song itself, or at least that clip of it. It sounds like the band is speaking English, but what were the lyrics? The name of the song has been speculated to be Like the Wind, the first line spoken. Many have tried to decipher the lyrics, but we still don't know for certain what they are. After the search had gained some traction, following their YouTube upload, Gab Gaskins created the subreddit The Mysterious Song, and that's when the search really kicked into high gear. With more people getting into the search, many new discoveries were made. People discovered that Blue's old original upload was hiding some secrets. Its metadata has the name Check It In, Check It Out, another line from the song. It also dates the song, or at least the recording, as being from 1984. Neither of these could be conclusively proven as fact, however. There has been a case similar to this song before. A Swedish song named On The Roof was unidentified from when it was first brought up in 2003 until 2013. The song was identified thanks to a recording from a German radio station, similar to the mysterious song, confirming that even though these are from German stations, the songs could be from anywhere, though it's likely of European origin. Eventually, people were able to track down more info about Blue themselves. Another post of theirs was found from 2007, where they said it was likely the song was recorded from the radio station NDR2. They also said it probably came from a show on the station called Music for Young People. With that info, people found the DJ who hosted that show. His name is Paul, and his show ran in 1982. The show was described to have current, often completely unknown music. Hmm. It appeared contacting Paul would be what would get this mystery solved. Unfortunately, his Facebook page, which was found and messaged, appeared to be abandoned, so they didn't get a reply. However, another Reddit user named JohnnyMe2 replied to a post about the song on r slash Germany, saying they remember the searches for it from 10 years prior. While they never found any identification back then, they still had something very important saved, the full recording of the song. Along with that, Paul began replying to the messages, showing that he was putting in a lot of effort to locate the song in his archives. To spread awareness, he even played the song on his current radio show in 2019, but no one contacted him with info about it. On August 20th, 2019, Gab Gaskins posted a very interesting update to their search. He was contacted by someone on Messenger, and they said, Hi Gabriel, I found out about you looking for the source of the most mysterious song on the internet. Well, I cannot tell you who the singer of the song is, but I can tell you that my brother did the radio recording in the early 80s, and I am the person who put this question into several places on the internet. 
it turns out this person was Blue, revealing their name to be Lydia. And their brother, Darius, is the one who made the recording. The one piece that saved this song from being totally lost forever. With their message, they included a photo of a typed up playlist from a mixtape they had made. The song is titled here as Blind the Wind. People were skeptical this person really was Blue, but they confirmed it by logging into one of their old accounts from 2007. While it was very cool that Blue had resurfaced, not much new was discovered here, besides that new speculated title. The recording, made by Darius, was not a direct rip of a radio station, but rather a mixtape, meaning even their recording only had the song itself, and didn't include any of that eh, totally unimportant DJ talk that would have completely explained what the song was. Oh well. And Darius had made several mixtapes of various songs, and over the years, several of the tracks on these tapes had become unknown. In 2004, he opened a website titled Unknown Pleasures, which was dedicated to tracking down the origins of these mysterious songs. Most of the songs he presented were found, but, of course, good old check it in, check it out remained unknown. Every now and then there will be new theories, updates, and tidbits to keep the search alive, but nothing based in fact has ever really shown up. This is one of those songs you hear in a dying mall and forget about, but then 15 years later you remember it and think, hey, that was a good song. People everywhere, even members of the radio station NDR2 like Paul are still searching for it. Perhaps one day they'll be able to solve the mystery. Even if it never gets solved, there is charm in a song being this impossible to crack mystery. It's definitely found its place in history, the ultimate underground hit. You know, the term lost media is kind of limiting. Media is far from all that gets lost, even just focusing on entertainment. What about physical items? Promotional items that have been lost to time? Adverts and flyers? Um, food? I'm still looking for images of some of those gumball ice cream bars. Fruit Brute, Yummy Mummy, the Shrek cereal, all gone. Though I guess it's just their experience that's been lost. Their existence is more than documented. There is a lot that's worth hunting for outside of the general scope of media. For example, toys. Hear me out, it might be my collector roots showing, but I definitely feel there are some great examples of lost merchandise. I guess it just comes down to what you're interested in. Lost music might not appeal to someone who doesn't care about music history. But with that said, let's talk about some lost toys. There are extremely rare cartoons and other pieces of media, just like there are extremely rare pieces of merchandise. And while you could argue stuff like prototypes or cancelled toys count here, for today, let's take a look at merchandise that was officially released, yet has become so rare it might as well not have been. Out of all the games in the Super Mario franchise, Super Mario RPG might be the one with the biggest cult following. References to the game nowadays are very scarce, so the majority of material made for the game come from around the time of its release. The game actually got a decent amount of merchandise, such as cards, figures, and most famously of all, a plush set. By the time the game came out, the company Takara had been making plush sets based off of Nintendo games for a long time, and they covered almost every big release you could think of. Yoshi's Safari got a set, so Mario RPG getting one was a no-brainer. This set was released in UFO catchers in Japan in the late 90s, and was seemingly produced in very low quantities. Today you can find a majority of Takara's Mario plushes fairly easily, some of them are pricey, but even those show up fairly often. That just isn't the case with the RPG set. Very few of these show up for sale, and as such, very few of them are even known to exist. The set contains Mario, Yoshi, Boshi, who is just awesome, a mushroom, a star, and uh, that's all that seems to show up, so the set contains five plushes, right? No, it actually doesn't. There is a sixth character in the set, being none other than Mallow. He got a plush. There are plenty of plushes that have limited or odd releases that cause them to become rare, but this one stands out because, well, it's Mallow! This image originates from an auction of various Mario plushes, with Mallow included, from the early 2000s. For such a long time, this was the only archived image of Mallow. In 2016, another lot appeared on Yahoo Japan auctions once again containing Mallow, and while this was special as he showed up after people realized he was such a rare piece, it didn't amount to much as the auction mysteriously ended early. In 2020, there was once again another Mario plush lot, this time on Mercari, featuring Mallow, and it sold for $20. Yep, his rarity has caused him to reach mythical levels no other Mario plush has seen. Mallow isn't that recognizable, so a lot of people who might own the plush might just not know who he is. It wasn't even confirmed he was really part of the set until this promotional Takara image appeared online, which came from a magazine advertising their products. Considering how dedicated the Mario collecting scene is, it's impressive just how elusive this guy has remained. You're a once in a franchise's lifetime plush, Mellow. Now if only there was a Geno to go with you.
The collecting scene for Dragon Ball is one of the most dedicated and, frankly, awesome scenes out there. There is such a rich history of Dragon Ball merchandise that, even before I had watched the series, I was already watching videos about its merch. Out of all Dragon Ball toys, figures tend to be what is collected the most, and many are extremely elusive. But what is the rarest officially licensed Dragon Ball figure? While there are many contenders, it turns out this franchise has a mallow of its own. And you know what? That might not even be a fair comparison. Introducing the Full Action Pose Yard Rat Goku figure by Bandai. The Bandai DBZ Full Action Pose figure series was released in 1992, and at the time of their release, they were considered the most articulated, highest quality figures yet released of these characters. Their clothing was made of cloth, their clothing was removable, they had amazing articulation, their detail was impeccable, it was a really great set. Unfortunately, not many characters were made. Super Saiyan Goku, Gohan, and Future Trunks were all that were produced. Well, besides, the fourth and final figure in this series, Super Saiyan Goku in his Planet Yard Rat outfit. The outfit he's wearing when he returns from space right when Future Trunks appears for the first time. To this day, this has to be the number one most legendary Dragon Ball Z figure, in my eyes at least. This figure is so elusive that, for decades, there wasn't even a single in-hand image of it. Many believed it never came out or possibly was even a hoax. Is this the Dragon Ball AF of DBZ figures? No, those images and the figure itself are very real. As the legend goes, this figure was produced in 1992 along with the rest of the series, but unlike those, it was released as a promotional item, given away in a contest at that year's Toei Cartoon Festival. Every year going back to 1969, Toei holds animation festivals, where they showcase their shows in the format of theatrical movies. This is where every old-school Dragon Ball movie premiered in Japan. This scan advertises there only being a hundred of this figure in existence, and for a very long time, no one had any images of it besides the stock photo, which was only found in places advertising the festival. So, did it come out? Did the contest happen? Or was this just a prototype that never saw mass, or, well, a hundred unit production? Limited merch drops aren't too uncommon, but the thing that made this figure stand out, beyond how high quality and amazing it looked, was how old it was. This was from 1992, so information on it was pretty spotty as details got lost in time. It was just a perfect storm for a legend status collectible. So, the question was, did it really come out? The answer, thankfully, was confirmed to be yes. On June 18th, 2016, a Japanese Dragon Ball collector posted on their blog that they found one, after 24 years of hunting. Thanks to this, we have clearer information on everything regarding this figure. This, for example, was the pamphlet that was given away at the 1992 festival, and according to the collector, you entered to win the figure by sending the application ticket attached to the pamphlet on a postcard. Basically, it seems the figure wasn't physically given away at the event, but to enter the contest to win one, you did have to go to the festival. Reading through the blog post, you can really feel how happy the collector was to finally have one of these. This really was a dream come true. It was just amazing to see new photos of this. And he lives up to the hype! What a beautiful figure! It's maybe not the rarest DBZ figure in terms of quantity, but probably the one with the most hype. Also, there have been more recent figures of Goku in this outfit, so if you do see a listing of a Yard Rat Goku figure, inspect it before freaking out. After so many years of it being a myth, to know they not only exist, but one is also safe and sound with a collector is amazing. Now to wonder where the rest are. Surely at least a few more are out there in the hands of private fans. But knowing so few existed in the first place, this one might be one of the few we ever see for all of time. There are many extremely rare pieces of merchandise, but it's especially rare for an item to have such great stories like these two. And there you have it, a look at some of the most fascinating cases of lost media from throughout the years. When lost media hunting first sprung into popularity in the mid-2010s, it immediately became one of my favorite interests. Following each and every search I saw was always a joy, and every now and then I check up on the scene to see what's currently being looked for. The discovery of McDonaldland Lock, Cracks, Clockman, even you, a day with Spongebob, all legendary cases I'll always cherish. I'm really happy Lost Media has become as big as it is, because this stuff really is important. It's only natural to fear the passage of time, knowing there's nothing you can do about it. What was once the norm will someday be nothing but a memory. What your life is like now could be unrecognizable in just a few years. That's just the way things are, and in most ways it's good, but it means we often forget what we've let go of. When you look back at your past, the media you've consumed is very important to all of us. So to hear something that people finally remember is missing makes it an instant target for a search. 
There's just a primal intrigue with this stuff. No matter how inconsequential some of it may seem, as long as it's important to some people and has a story to be told, it's worth finding. Lost media represents those memories we wish we could relive. Finding anything from our past is always a great feeling, and likewise, knowing something is truly gone forever is the worst. Many of you likely have personal lost items. Maybe photos or recordings of family members you wish you could find again, childhood toys you wish you could see one more time. There will always be things we wish we could experience again, and while there isn't much to be done with stuff like that, there's always hope something like a piece of media will resurface. To try and prevent personal lost media, here's a tip. No matter how embarrassed you are by your work from the past, do not delete it. Unlist it or take it down, but save it. Back it up. You'll be glad you did if you ever want to relive those memories. It's pretty easy to understand the appeal of a topic like lost media, but it's still so great to see it's caught on in the way it did. The fact that so many people have dedicated their time to finding this stuff is something I'll always be grateful for. We've gotten to see so much we would have never been able to if not for these search efforts. Lost media is also crucial because it's just important to document our history, especially so we know what works and what doesn't. If I dare bring up that Hitler sitcom again, the fact we have that pilot episode archived is great, so no one else repeats the idea. Even if it's something we'd rather forget, it's good we can always look back on what's happened. Mistakes in media happen, whether it be due to the culture at the time, or bad timing with a tragic disaster, we should never forget what's happened and what has been made. Even this stuff is part of history. Warner Brothers does an excellent job with this. On various releases of their older work, they include disclaimers that pretty much state it would be worse to pretend their offensive pieces of media never happened. Preservation is important so we can understand what made them horrible to begin with. Everything has some form of significance. There will come a day where it's possible that everything we've ever known will be incredibly hard to find or lost. Far in the future, sure, but it's up to us to save our history now to try and prevent that. In 300 years, who's going to remember Kids Tube or Kappa Mikey? Think of all the content we know now. It may all one day be forgotten, and that's a scary thought. We can only hope that we'll continue to do our best to preserve the history of all we love for the future.